Howdy race fans, I am Stock Car Scott and this is my little show about racing I like to call In the Pits. No backtracking from last weekend, rather last week at the week's show, because it speaks for itself. There was another version, but I accidentally deleted it, so that's what you got. The first race of last weekend was the ARCA 200 lap event live on Fox Sports 1 at Lucas Oil Raceway Park in Claremont, Indiana as part of the Brickyard Weekend at Indianapolis Speedway down the road. But I missed the beginning of the race because my last delivery of the week as a courier was a waking nightmare, folks. But that is why we have video recording equipment. I still use my tried and true old VCR. The ARCA day started with Grant Enfinger still trailing Mason Mitchell in the points, but he had a big announcement of his new opportunity at Spencer Gallagher Racing in a new number 90 Chevrolet Impala. An Alabama born driver in a Chevy. I'm as happy as a clam in sand, folks. Mason Mitchell in the number 98 Ford led early but had rear end problems, so Enfinger's top five finish leapfrogged Rant back over the top end to the top end points, leading now over Mason again. Now in the race, number four, Brandon Jones qualified his Turner Scott. Motorsports Exide Batteries Chevrolet Impala. That's a mouthful. He said on the pole for just his second ARCA start. His first start ended in a victory at Winchester, Indiana, when Jones shoved Mason Mitchell out of the way on the last lap. This week, Brandon, only 17 years old, didn't have to door anyone this time to get his second ARCA race in a win and as many starts. Now, second place was 18-year-old uh, uh, Austin Wayne Self of Austin, Texas, and the number 44 Menards Toyota of veteran nine-time ARCA champion Frank Kimmel finished third, and that maintains his third place uh, in the points. No relation to Jimmy. Nope. You're watching In the Pits with Stock Car Scott. Thank you, Nick. Also, on Fox Sports 1 this past weekend, there were a couple of K&N races, one west and one east, and I managed to miss both of them, folks. I didn't record them, and I didn't get to watch them. I just got too busy. But I hope to get to see them sometime there on Fox Sports 1, but I really have my doubts. Mm -hmm. While doing laundry, Saturday, the Fox Sports channels uh, came to mind as I thought maybe maybe they should call them Sox Sports 1 and 2 because as a pair, I can only ever find one. I know where to find number two. <laughs> Saturday started out with qualifying for Formula 1 at Hungary, then nationwide qualifying at the Brickyard, followed by Sprint Cup qualifying. In Hungary, near I, Budapest, I am actually. Uh, Lewis Hamilton's Mercedes caught fire on the first round of qualifying, and like last weekend at Hockenheim in Germany, it left him <laughs> having to start way back in the back again, while his teammate Nico Rosberg sat on the pole again. Then, in Nationwide Series, Kyle, the Toad Bush, was on the pole for this weekend's race again. Now, that's where the similarities to last weekend ended. Number four, Kevin, ha Kevin Harvick won the pole for Sunday's Brickyard 400 with a new track record. I know I'm no Tom Carnegie. After Sprint Cup qualifying was the 100 lap nationwide event that was led early by Sprint Cup regulars Kyle the Toad Bush in the number 54 Monster Toyota 
and Kevin Happy Harvick and the them, number man. five Junior Motorsports Camaro. As with the big event, uh, Sunday, ESPN supplied free Race Buddy, which is really great with uh, all the ride-along cameras that they do, as well as all the alternative views around the track. Many of the drivers that morning, or, or Saturday, could have used an alternative view there because early they were finding their windshields were being covered uh, to the point of obscurity with bug carcasses. Yeah, well, sometimes you the windshield, sometimes you the bug. But uh, finally the swarm abated, and with the tear-offs all removed, vision was restored. It was a real exciting end that uh, involved a little bit of fuel strategy, and, and it ended with uh, one of the Dash for Cash eligible drivers, Richard Childress is racing uh, uh, Ty Dillon, uh, Richard Childress's grandson, racing in the number three. Uh, he passed the toad there in uh, the last restart to win the race and an extra $100,000. So, anyway, points later, uh, Chase Elliott ran up in the top 10 most of the uh, race, but strategy on the number 9 Napa uh, Autosports Camaro just didn't work out and he finished in 12th place. Uh, other uh, five, uh, there, excuse me, other top five drivers uh, point positions, they, they remain the same. So uh, the next four eligible drivers there for the Nationwide Dash for Cash are, are going to be, of course, Ty Dillon, the winner, Brian Scott, no relation, who finished seventh in an RCR car, uh, Trevor Bain so uh, in ninth place uh, in a Jack Roush car, uh, and second place in points, Reagan Smith in the number seven Junior Motorsports Camaro. He finished 10th. Ooh, junior. Okay, so after seeing uh, Ty Dillon win, then I went on out to Evergreen Speedway in Monroe, as the videos that I've already posted on my YouTube channel will t attest. There were uh, quite a few divisions, there were like, but they had two late model 50 lap mains. The other divisions that I really liked are, were the street stocks and the mini stocks. Uh, some of my good friends there on Facebook uh, ran Saturday night and some of them did well in their racing endeavors and some didn't do so well. There, <clears throat> there was a first time winner as I had hoped for uh, on a Facebook post earlier in the day, but it just wasn't quite the winner that I had in mind when I posted it. Now, when I got there to Evergreen, they were doing heat races and one of my Facebook friends, uh, Scott Burby, won his heat race in his now 41, I think it used to be 14, numbered uh, mini stock Mustang in a foreshadowing of the later division main. The main races of uh, the fav one, another one of my favorite divisions uh, were fairly interesting there uh, with the late, late model 50 lap main coming first. Uh, that was when Facebook friend, new Facebook friend, Mike Holden in his number 32. Mike Harden. Harden, thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mike. He, he just subscribed to your YouTube channel today, so welcome, Mike. Thank Glad you. Glad to have you on, buddy. Thank you very much, Mike. But uh, Mike Harden in his number 32, uh, and this is helping him uh, grow his points lead there for the track championship there at, uh, Evergreen. at Evergreen. Congratulations, Mike. The mini stock main uh, was won by Facebook friend Scott Burby uh, with a pass on Andrew Shukar on the next to the last lap, leading as he passed under the white flag, and then he led the last lap to the win. Congratulations, Scott. The, the street stock main winner was... No relation? Nope, no relation to stock car, Scott. Okay. Uh, street Stock main winner was number one, Roger Drake. Thanks who, a lot of himself. <laughs> Roger Drake, who passed Carl Davidson late in the 30 lap main in an exciting victory. Congratulations, Roger. Woohoo! Oh, let me get a drink. Ladies and gentlemen, you are watching In the Pits with Stock Car Scott.
Oh, thank you, Nick. The last race of the evening was the second of the 50 lap main late model races. Um, now there were, I think, 14 cars, correct me if I'm wrong, in the first race, and only two of them didn't make it out to the second race, so it was a really good night of racing. Sounds right to me. Uh, the second race had a few more cautions in it than the first race. Uh, the field for the second race was set by an inversion of all the cars on the lead lap. So if you finish last on the lead lap, you were on the pole, which is where a young Facebook friend of mine, Brandon Schieber, was for the second race in his number 75. Another Facebook friend also started up front. That's Andy Soul in the number 20. And uh, he ran that night with much promise, but unfortunately that remained unfulfilled because he got run over and run off the track in turn three. Poor kid. He's no kid. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to give him, you know, make it feel good. Young, young Shiver, though, was able to hold off all other challengers to win his first ever NASCAR Wheeling All-American Late Model Victory. Congratulations, Brandon. Woohoo! After the races, it was nice to stop by the pits and see many of my Facebook friends in real life. And make sure they weren't, he wasn't getting catfished. And congratulate them for a good run or offer condolences on a bad night. It was, it, it gave me a chance to say Howdy to Facebook friends Andy, Tim, Brandon, Molly, and Jana. Good to see you all. See, Facebook is good for something. Sunday was a busy day with the Hungarian Grand Prix early and then the Brickyard 400, not as early. <laughs> Speaking of early, there he you is. see who I've added to my set? Yeah, we forgot to welcome the new co-host to yep. the show, man. So, yeah. uh, the broadcast of the Hungarian Grand Prix began, uh, began at 4.30 a.m. Sunday morning, so I recorded it <laughs> <laughs> with uh, Nico Rosberg on the pole and my favorite Lewis Hamilton starting on pit lane after a fire and qualifying. I, I didn't hold out the whole lot of hope for Hamilton's day, but he was to prove otherwise, folks. The... Uh, conditions there in Budapest were quite challenging with on again off again rain that decided to be on again at the beginning of the Grand Prix so the field was mandated to run on full wet tires it was an uneventful start for a change as you know with a lot of, uh, of F1 races there's usually some sort of event right at the first turn almost but uh, they got off to a good start now Hamilton uh, ran that first lap from the pits, but when they almost got to that end of that first lap, he spun off the track. In fact, he wasn't alone. There were lots of people who spun off at the very same place during the race, and a couple of those back marker cars had some pretty spectacular single car crashes in those uh, spins off the track. And no one was immune later in the race, four-time and defending champion Sebastian Vettel spun and just missed hitting the retaining wall. Lewis used the wet tires to his advantage, passing drivers that were out there in lesser equipment like Caterhams and, uh, and Marushas and anyway, uh, and during the early stages of the race of the Grand Prix and during this time Rossberg didn't just run away with the race like he has been the past couple of weeks. Uh, Vettel and uh, Alonso, Fernando Alonso, they were giving Nico Rosberg all he could handle during that first part of the race. Then it was Daniel Ricciardo and Alonso that kept uh, Rosberg busy while Hamilton slugged his way through the pack. As, as the Grand Prix, oh I need to get a drink. Yeah you do. And that's a great time for me to tell you folks, be sure to tell your friends to tune in to In the Pits with Stock Car Scott on Thursday nights. We don't have a set time, but the video will be up there on Thursday nights. Tell your friends all your stock car racing needs right here. Back to F1. As the uh, F1 Grand Prix progressed, the track dried and Hamilton 
through his superior driving skills and some strategic pitting, found himself at one point near the end of the race to be bleeding. Someone who had started on the pit row, leading the race. But he was passed uh, during those last final laps uh, by Alonzo and Ricardo, who were on the fresher option tires. And then Ricardo put on a heck of a pass uh, to get past Alonzo uh, there on the next to the last lap. And that was the pass for the win. Ham Hamilton, meanwhile, was just left back there in third uh, with a heated battle with his teammate Rosberg, which just angered Rosberg so much. He, he didn't hardly even talk during the post-race. But uh, Hamilton was able to get on the podium. And though uh, Daniel Ro Ricardo had a very good run, even a great run for him, for his second ever Grand Prix win, Lewis Hamilton had a fantastic run, starting from, like I said, pit lane, which means the last starting position, folks, and he finished on the podium. And he gained points, championship points, on his teammate, the leader in points, who is now only 11 away. Okay, so that leaves us the Brickyard. That started on ESPN da -da -da, da -da -da. at 9 early o'clock in the morning. I have never been an early riser, folks, and this time zone is going to be the death of me. It was the 21st running of the summer event, and I, I have watched all of them. The first one, of course, was won by then Wonder Boy Jeff Gordon in his second season in NASCAR uh, in Cup. And Indianapolis, they had Jeff Gordon Day to celebrate. They celebrated their homeboy, uh, home state boy done good. They really think, think a lot of him there. Back home in Indiana, or however Jim Neighbor sings it. So, Jeff started the race only one of two drivers that had ever started all of the uh, Brickyard uh, 400s. The other, Bobby Labonte. So, there beside Jeff Gordon is number four on the pole, Kevin Harvick, in the freaky fast Jimmy Johnson Chevrolet. And it was. That's Jimmy why Johnson. it was on the on the front row. And But, old Wonder Boy was showing he still had it there when it came to qualifying and racing. Oh, FYI, my favorite driver, you know who, was uh, starting back in 23rd. Dale ran uh, okay at times. Uh, even up into the top five, but he didn't lead any laps. Uh, he ended up with a top ten, finishing, I think, ninth uh, for his day's work. My other favorite driver, Kevin Harvick, of course, started out happy there in first, but ended up the race in eighth, though he ran a lot better than that throughout the race. The top two rookies uh, both finished up in the top ten. Uh, with the new Wonder Boy, Kyle Larson, finishing seventh for Kyle, uh, for excuse me, Chip Ganassi, and RCR Legacy driver Austin Dillon in his Pop Pop number three Chevrolet finished tenth. Casey Kane of nearby Enumclaw led many laps during the Brickyard 400 in the number five Hendrix Chevrolet, but old tires lost him the lead on the final restart to teammate Jeff Gordon, who rolled to a historic fifth win at Indianapolis Speedway. Even Jeff says that that was the best restart of his life. And yes, he did. He really and did. that is historic because there's only one driver that's, uh, other driver that's won five races at Indianapolis, and that's Formula One driver Michael Schumacher. All of the guys who have won uh, uh, in the 500s, four is the most. So, Jeff Gordon, 
Michael Schumacher, most wins at Indy. Oh, back to uh, Casey. Well, one more thing on Jeff. That's his 90th win, folks. 90 wins in the 20, 21 years that he's been uh, in NASCAR Cup racing. And for better or worse, I've seen every one of them. You might not like him, but you got to respect him. Uh, one thing, Casey Kane, uh, he didn't have a bad finish, but he did fall back to sixth place. Uh, to finish off the top ten, we uh, have the three Joe Gibbs racing Camrys. They finished right behind Jeff Gordon where they needed to, with the Toad being second. <laughs> a lot of love in this room. Denny Hamlin in third. Woo! Matt Kenseth in fourth. But Denny Hamlin's car was impounded by NASCAR ah, in post-race inspection because of some rear firewall plates and how yeah. they were mounted. Haters. But, but back to the finishing order. Uh, in fifth place was Joker Logano there in Penske's number 22. And that was the only Ford in the top 10. Speaking of Fords. They make great trucks. The other big news, but what kind of truck do you drive, Nick? Chevrolet. <laughs> That's all I can afford. <clears throat> the other big news from the Brickyard on Sunday before the race even got started was an unexpected announcement by Jack Roush. Who? Jock Rash. Thank you. That irritating old man. That his three Ford lineup for 2015 would not repeat, not include Carl Edwards who has raced his entire 11 year NASCAR career with Roush Racing. No backflips for you. Carl, he'd be doing his backflips someplace Somebody else next else, year. That's right. Carl seemed to be taken quite aback by this uh, surprise news release, much the same way as Matt Kenseth had been done a few years ago. And just like with Matt Kenseth, uh, who like Edwards right now, had a couple of uh, wins and was in the championship hunt. Old Jock Rash did not allow Matt Kenseth to win the uh, championship a couple of years ago when he is in that situation. You think he's going to let Carl Edwards win this year? I think not. Sorry, race fans, but that old man, he just needs to get some fresh blood into the management part of, of Rouse Racing or it's going to go the way of DEI. Remember them? Now they're, you know, they're no longer DEI. They D-I-E. <clears throat> anyway, so, meanwhile, Matt and Carl, who we all know are such good friends, will be teammates once again there at Joe Gibbs Racing. <laughs> when, when uh, they expect to open up a fourth team there. Uh, what I've heard so far is that uh, m ms isn't real happy with the driver that they have right now. <laughs> That's just a lot of love in this room. Yeah, uh, they're not real happy with him, and so they want to get someone with a little bit nicer uh, Poor, poor Rowdy, just representation. so misunderstood. Right. So it's, it's, it's sounding like... Uh, Carl Edwards is going to be the in the number 18, going to be the candy man, and go. they're going to move uh, the toad over to the monster mobile, uh, the number 74 monster, or excuse me, 54, 54. monster energy drink is, uh, sounds like they're going to step up for a full ride there. But um, back to a little other Joe Gibbs racing news. Bum, bum, bum. Yes, Tuesday, the NASCAR hammer came down on the Joe Gibbs number 11 FedEx Toyota team. Haters everywhere. NASCAR did not like them tampering with that rear firewall uh, plate there on the number 11. NASCAR had previously warned them about Whatever. attempting to, uh, to evacuate air 
by not properly securing these uh, plates to the rear firewall. Well, the thing that NASCAR really doesn't like is that that rear firewall separates the, the fuel cell and the trunk from the driver's compartment, so they want that area sealed up. Of course, crew chief wants it a little loose so air underneath the car can evacuate up through it and help with the downforce of the car. Well, even though that's some ingenious uh, engineering there, NASCAR didn't quite see it that way. Because they had already shaken their finger at them, that's considered the number one. They whipped a number five on them, folks. I hate to see when they put a six on them. <laughs> you know, and what they do to the uh, what they do to the women at the number six dance. It's okay, Denny. They hate you when you're great. But anyway, so uh, they whipped a number five on them. Uh, that means that uh, JGR has been fined uh, $175,000, no. docked 75 owner points, no. also docked 75 driver points. No. This doesn't knock Denny out of the chase uh, because he's got a win, and it only knocks him down to about 21st, so uh, he, he still should be able to make the chase. And to help ensure that... Um, that's how good he is. Yeah, uh, uh, Joe Gibbs is going to go ahead with the last part of the penalty, and that is the six-week suspension of the crew chief, Darian Grubb, and the car chief, Wesley Sherrill. They're going to go ahead and appeal the ruling, but they're going to serve the suspensions. That way they'll be done with the six weeks before the chase, the uh, last 10 chase races start. Back in time for Chicago. Right, so if they lose the appeal, they still get to be in the chase races. Okay, y'all guys need to behave. Uh, one last uh, <laughs> NASCAR item. We found out that Greg Ives, who is currently the crew chief for NASCAR Phenom, Chase Elliott, w has been named to replace Steve Letarte as Dale Jr.'s crew chief for next year on Woo! the number 98 Chevrolet, or 98, 88, my goodness. Oh my lord. Nearly the number. It's late. 88 Chevrolet as Letarte is going off to NBC to call races from the booth boom, next boom. season with, uh, I do believe, uh, Rick Allen from the truck series and uh, Jeff Burton, a uh, retired NASCAR driver. So, Folks, well, it was a swell weekend of racing there on television and out at Evergreen Speedway. Hopefully, uh, you've seen and enjoyed the video of racing from Evergreen that's on my YouTube channel. If not, please check it out and tell me what you think. I can take it, folks. No, he can't. Okay. He cries. He yes, cries. I do. He, he just gets so excited. He don't like my video. He just doesn't even want to go out anymore. He's just, uh, next weekend, next weekend locally, I am planning to attend the Rumble in Rochester 75 uh, lap street stock main there at South Sound Speedway, where I hope to see my favorite West Coast street stock driver. He hasn't been racing there a whole lot this year, but he has, so... Hopefully, get to see Mike. Also on the card for that evening is a 100-lap Pro 4 late model series. This is full-size late models with four-cylinder engines in them, and they put on a really good show, folks. So, folks, you're watching In the Pits with Stock Car Scott. One more pit stop with Sterling there. Also locally, um... Drag racing. There's NHRA drag racing this weekend. Sunday, 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 and also Saturday at Pacific Raceways in Kent. Um, it's the big time drag racing folks with John Force and his daughters and all the big time the big fuel racing and all that sort of stuff. It's happening Saturday and Sunday off of Highway 18 there in Kent. On TV, most of the racing this weekend is at Pocono. And it's if it doesn't rain. 
it seems that Pocono must be some sort of Pen Pennsylvania Dutch word for rain and more rain. It's or also, Amish. yeah, it's 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 not uncommon for you maybe even to see wildlife hop out onto the backstretch there for the uh, on the uh, Long Pond backstretch. Yeah, free venison for everyone. Yes. The first race there at Pocono will be tomorrow, Friday. It's a short race that comes on, I think, about 2 o'clock uh, Friday afternoon. Then Saturday morning is the truck race, the Camping World truck race. It's a rather short race also. Both of these will be on Fox Sports 1. Then early on Sunday, early, early, 9 o'clock in the morning or something, the Sprint Cup race will be on ESPN if it doesn't rain. A few years ago, the race at Pocono was shortened, thankfully, from 50, 500 miles, it's getting late folks, to 400 miles. That made it a race that uh, was much more watchable and easier to get in in between the rain delays. The other NASCAR race that's going to be happening this weekend will be the Nationwide 250 in Iowa on Saturday night. Probably going to miss that one when I go see the uh, Rumble at Rochester. But it should be a really good race because it's standalone nationwide with uh, probably no cup regulars, maybe one or two, and it really gives the nationwide guys a chance to shine. All those young kids like Ty Dillon and Chase Elliott. There's no Formula One for a while. A couple, of, I think they're taking the next three weekends off. Formula One mandates a vacation. They have to close the car factories during those uh, three weeks and give everyone time off. But if you really need to watch open wheel racing, then the Indy Racing League takes on uh, the Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course Sunday. And I think that Nationwide is going to run there in a couple of weeks also. So, there you go, folks. That about covers it. it was, it's been fun. So, please, tune in next week and watch this race-crazy stock car fan. Until then, we'll see you all at the races. You've been watching In the Pits with Stock Car Scott. Be sure to join us here every Thursday night on YouTube for another installment. We'll see you next week.